Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for such a purposeful event. He for She at the University of Guelph is now in its fourth year, celebrated on the tail end of International Women's Day. My name is Gerarda Darlington, Interim Dean of the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences at the University of Guelph in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. We will now present a territorial acknowledgement. Again, welcome to everyone in attendance from near and far. As I understand, we have some attendees from very far, the United States, Mexico, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Germany, Netherlands, Nigeria, Kenya, Saudi Arabia, China, and more. While the global pandemic has restricted our ability to meet together on the University of Guelph's beautiful picturesque campus, it has provided opportunities to welcome friends and colleagues from around the world for which we are very grateful. Tonight is a collaboration between two University of Guelph faculties, the Gordon S. Lang School of Business and Economics and the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences, as well as the University of Guelph's Griffin football team. The He for She initiative is a global movement to encourage all genders to stand for gender equality. Launched in 2014 by the United Nations, the solidarity movement has resulted in billions of social media conversations and events worldwide. I mentioned earlier that I am interim dean of the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences. In our disciplines across Canada, which span chemistry, computer science, engineering, mathematics and statistics, and physics, we continue to see per persistent gender imbalance in student enrollment, and correcting that imbalance is a core strategy for us at the University of Guelph. Gender equality is not an issue of one gender versus another. It is a human rights issue. Conversations like he for she cultivate a supportive, inclusive campus where all genders can feel comfortable pursuing their goals and dreams, whether they be in the arts, business, social sciences, or STEM fields. He for she provides a pathway through which people of all genders can build awareness and actionable change for a more equitable future. Thank you for joining us today for this important conversation. I welcome my colleague, Lisa Porth, Dean of the Gordon S. Lang School of Business and Economics to discuss he for she further and what you can expect of our event today. Thank you, Gerarda, for that introduction and welcome everyone to our annual he for she at U of G event. The Lang School of Business and Economics is proud to be a co-presenter of tonight's important event as we come together as a community to celebrate our collective efforts in improving gender equality. As a champion of the United Nations Responsible Business Education Initiative, Lang is committed to developing ethical, inclusive and responsible business leaders. Tonight's event is an integral part of our mission to engage and inspire communities and take bold action towards gender equality. Tonight, you will hear from leaders across our community who have done just that, taken bold action to ensure that all genders have an equal voice and opportunities both on campus and in the workplace. We are incredibly honored to have with us this evening Canada's 26th Governor General, 
the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson, who will speak passionately about the importance of resilience and leadership and how these important traits can be developed to help conquer new challenges. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you two leaders within our community to give welcoming remarks. Please welcome the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Guelph, Dr. Charlotte Yates, and the Mayor of the City of Guelph, Cam Guthrie. Good evening. Hello, and thank you for joining us this evening during our fourth annual He for She University of Guelph event. Tonight, we will be highlighting just some of the ways our community comes together to promote and improve gender equality and inclusion on campus and in our workplace. While much work still needs to be done, events like these are times to celebrate our successes, to chart our course forward, and to kickstart conversations about what's next, what's important, and how we move the dial forward on achieving gender equality. The goal of the He for She movement is to achieve equality by encouraging all genders to participate as agents for change, to take action against negative stereotypes and negative behaviors. He for She is not only an invitation for men, it is an invitation for all genders to stand in solidarity with marginalized genders to create a bold, visible, and united force for change to improve gender equality. I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to Madam Clarkson for joining us this evening and giving us powerful words of wisdom and vision and advice for the future. It is truly an honor to have you with us tonight. And please, when it is safe to do so, please come back to campus and see us here in person. We would love to welcome you on campus as you are an honorable visitor to the campus and really are an icon for change. I would also like to say thank you to all of you for engaging in the event this evening. Gender equality cannot be accomplished alone and in isolation. It requires that we work as a community, together, advancing change, advancing equality. We need to have important conversations to open minds and to change behaviors. Thank you and enjoy the remainder of the program. Hi everybody, uh, Mayor Cam Guthrie here, and thank you so much for the opportunity to welcome our very special guest to our community. On behalf of the City of Guelph and City Council, I'm very pleased to welcome Canada's 26th Governor General, the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson, to this virtual event. Um, I understand that Madam Clarkson has actually uh, visited Guelph uh, several times. So she received an honorary degree in 2006 from the University of Guelph. And I'm told that she likes our downtown, including visiting our wonderful local bookstore, The Bookshelf. So uh, welcome back and maybe on the way out, you can buy another book. Uh, I also know that um, she has a really great story to share uh, of re resilience and, uh, and her story, you know, even prior to her becoming the leader that she was in the role that she had and now even after she continues to inspire so many. I also want to really thank her for coming here and for the sponsors and the University of Guelph, Guelph football uh, team and everybody else that's putting on the he for she event. And you know as the mayor, as a husband, uh, as a father, um, I know that these issues are really important for men and boys. Uh, around these gender equity issues. And so I'm very glad that they're being talked about and promoted here today. So all the best to your event. Uh, and I'm uh, sorry, of course, that none of us can really be in person right now. It is what it is. But I know that we'll take away something for sure that we can apply to the rest of our lives uh, based on what our special guest speaks about today. So thank you very much and take care. Bye bye. Thank you, President Yates and Mayor Cam. 
Because of COVID, we've all been forced to transition many important initiatives to virtual settings. One cause that cannot be paused, however, is the need to have open and honest dialogue around inclusion and diversity. Last week, students from the Lang School led virtual workshops with members of our U of G community, including faculty, staff, and students to help facilitate these important discussions. The following video highlights just some of the students who participated in these workshops and recaps our He for She campaign and the impact we have had. Society as a whole will benefit when everyone is able to fully participate in the society. Gender equality benefits everyone and we're not going to get anywhere unless everyone's working together to challenge the storms and make this progress and make the change that we all would benefit so much from. We're really aiming to get this conversation going with students and to really get it going um, in a virtual format. I want to engage in these workshops not only as an opportunity to spread the message and get people talking about gender inequity, but to also learn for myself about ways that we can have more open and honest communications and work together to ensure that uh, future generations will not have to face the same inequities that we do today. And every time I come out of these workshops learning something new because it is an evolving topic and it's interesting to be able to bring together groups of students such as engineers or the science students who we don't get to work with typically to really get a diverse viewpoint. STEM is a very big field that is male dominated and so it's important to work towards gender equality specifically in science so that we are able to reach that balance. We're all equal and we all deserve the same opportunities to excel in the workplace and show off our best abilities. The football team is participating in the Heat for She movement because not only are we a very large group of people, but we're also a large group that's in a male dominant sport and being able to come together not only as just our team, but extend that to our communities and the interactions with the people that we have. I think we're able to interact with a, a very large number of people in a very broad range. I do believe that all genders should be at the table when talking and discussing about uh, gender equality. I think that when you're trying to fight for, for a good cause and to make a change in this world, there's no better way to do it than to be together. Once you can get everyone together, it makes a better impact. There's more people fighting for the goal and it's easier to achieve your goal. It's very important, especially in a virtual setting, for these conversations to continue to ensure that we're still going in the right direction. Everyone can be involved. It doesn't have to be through a club or through a group. It really does start with the conversations you know, with your roommate, with your friend, with your mom, with your dad, with a sibling, with any family member. By pushing forward equality for all genders, we will be able to push forward society as a whole. Knowing what gender equity is, what gender inequality is, is crucial. Not just to have the conversation, but to know how you can make an impact and understanding what the true problem is and how we can change that these kind of things exist and we don't even know and like challenging them and like fighting them off is really essential and i'm happy that campus is contributing towards that i am he for she i am he for she I am he for she. I am he for she. I am he for she. I am. I am he for she. I am he for she. I am he for she. Thank you to the Lang students for leading these outstanding workshops. It is so impressive to see students in our community leading and learning alongside each other. But that is something we know we can expect from our community, respect, inclusion, and support. We are a community that supports each other and knows we only achieve true success when all of our members have equal opportunity. Griffin football team members have a vital role in he for she as established student leaders on campus. With their participation, 
They show the impact that having many groups in all genders can have to improve gender equality on campus. I would now like to invite University of Guelph student and member of the Griffin football team, Anthony Hall, to present the team's involvement with He for She. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Anthony Hall. I'm born and raised in Montreal, Quebec, and I'm currently in my third year of general studies, taking predominantly business classes to hopefully transfer into the, into the school line of business next fall. Having the opportunity to speak on behalf of the team to show our support for the He for She movement is truly a blessing for me. I come from a family of 13 kids where nine of the children are women, strong women at that. Those women day in and day out continuously support me every day, even though they have their own issues. I have my older sister, Renee, who is like a second mother to me that I go to to hear the stuff that I need to hear in terms of tough love. I go to my mom if I need to feel a little bit soft and a little, I need a little bit of caring. And I go to my other sisters if I need laughs and giggles when I'm feeling down. It's truly a blessing to have those women in my life who love me unconditionally. Without them, I will not be where I am today. As for the women who work our day in and day out on our team, we have the assistant therapists who join our team every year. We have different at that. We have different assistant therapists that join our year every year to attain their goal of becoming athletic therapists themselves and assure that everybody on the team is healthy and ready to go for game day. We have Lindsay Williams, man, is she amazing. No matter how goofy or how hard we are to work with sometimes, this woman is there for us day in and day out to support us with our education, to assure that we are successful off the field, which is the most important thing. We have the pop group led by Bruno Ferraro and the other mothers on the players on the team that plan out several events for the team that and that work weekends when they're not even supposed to, they don't even need to, to show our support and be the loudest fans in the stands for us. Those women are truly a blessing in our lives. Looking at the women athletics, we have several teams that are truly successful. We have the women's hockey team. We have the women's hockey team that won nationals two years ago. We have the field hockey team who won the OUA. The women's track team are just amazing with the amount of accolades that they've brought in throughout the years. Thinking about their athleticism, I'm not gonna lie, I do feel jealous of them. We have the women's rugby team who are truly successful as well. When we hear their game, when we are playing throughout our games and here to score that they're winning 118 to nothing. I'm not going to lie, I do get a little bit jealous, but at the end of the day, I'm truly happy of, about their success. We have teams that even go unnoticed on our team that people don't know about. We have figure skating, rowing, synchronized swimming, curling, etc. These teams need to, all these women, female teams need to know that the football team is truly there for them, especially the He for She program to show that our support and their hard work is not gonna go unnoticed. Our football team are the big guys on campus, yes, but we assure that we show support to women athletics as well as the female scholars who day in and day out maybe feel as if they're not receiving the support they deserve. Our goal as a football team is to show that they are seen, they are supported, they are respected. That is why Coach Lang, Coach Sheen, and the other coaches preach to us that we have to support all. They make us realize that these women work hard behind the scenes to assure our success. And as I said a good amount of times in this speech, is it, it is truly a blessing to hear that from them. Just to speak briefly on the He for She movement and to remind everybody, the He for She movement is an opportunity for all genders to come together, to have a voice and to take action against negative stereotypes. It's not just an invitation for men, it's an invitation for everyone, all genders, to stand up for equality. Looking at the He for She program, I can see nothing but greatness will arise from all the Griffin, from all, uh, will arise for all. And the Griffin football team will always be a major supportive of this initiative. Now, to go to our keynote presentation, it was my pleasure to introduce to you, after arriving in Canada with her family in 1942, Madam Clarkson made the astonishing journey from child refugee to accomplished broadcaster, journalist, and distinguished public servant. Madam Clarkson, was the 26th governor general from 1999 to 2005. When she left Rideau Hall, she co-founded the Institution for Canadian Citizenship, which helps new citizens feel involved and included in our Canadian life. On behalf of the University of Guelph, 
please welcome Canada's 26th Governor General, the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was a wonderful introduction. And I've had a wonderful day with you all, um, with various people from the different faculties, with faculty members, and I've enjoyed it enormously. I love Guelph. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, little town and city. And um, it has my favorite bookstore in it, the bookshelf. And also, I used to have a, um, uh, a country property very near the Guelph line. So Guelph was very close to me for a number of years. And um, I want to thank you very much for asking me to take part in what looked at first like a very heavy day. But really, when we're not able to get together face to face, we have to make allowances for each other. And we also have to say, well, we are together because thanks to technology, we can see each other and we can speak to each other. And I've gotten quite used to this Zoom and um, enjoyed it very much. I was deeply honored when I was approached about this for the He For She um, program because I felt that it meant that the University of Guelph wanted me as who I was and who I, how I've lived my life to be part of this terrific initiative which the UN has started. And I guess for me, there are a number of things that are really important in my life. The first is that I was a refugee, that I came to this country with nothing and having everything taken away. The second is that I am a woman and I grew up as a woman here in Canada. And the third is that I have made myself capable of helping other people to live their lives even if they've started with nothing, and even if there has been gender bias against them. I think it's really interesting to think of those things in terms of my own life when I reflect on it. When I became Governor General, I received all kinds of letters from people in grade six, uh, because in grade six, you learn about uh, the Governor General. So I had a number of letters, and the one I remembered so well, and I've kept it, I took it out of my files at Rito Hall, and I've kept it for my own, was from a, a girl who was Portuguese and she was in grade six and she said you became governor general and I think that I can become governor general too and I thought what better reward could I have for living my life than to think of this child in grade six thinking her life can make a difference too and that there won't be barriers for her I grew up at a time when there were a lot of barriers and I've lived through them and I've lived to tell the tale. But being a refugee is very, very much a part of who I am. It's very much a part of how I look at the world, how I look at other people, how I look at Canada. Let's start with the last first. Canada welcomed me and my family. We had one suitcase each. We were on a Red Cross ship. We landed and came to Ottawa. And from there, we built our lives. We had had a quite good life before, as many refugees did uh, and have. And my parents were uh, in their late 20s and early 30s. And they had two children of seven and three. And they remade their life. My father, because he had been a businessman in Hong Kong, was able to get a job with the Canadian government as a very lowly clerk in the Department of Trade and Commerce during the war, because they needed people who knew some international things and it was enough to keep us going and alive and it gave us our start. And Canada has always been very, very welcoming in the best sense to us. That doesn't mean laying out a red carpet and saying you can do anything you want, but saying to us basically in the friends that we made and the people who helped us in the beginning, saying if you want to participate in life in Canada, we are willing to have you be part of it. And that's what it all means. And that's what gender equality means. And that's what being a refugee means. It's belonging. It's basically saying to yourself, you know, I know that I belong in this country. And if, if people don't say that, then we don't have a country that's worth its name. I think that Canada has been an extraordinary country in many ways. Because when I came to it, it was this little white country full of white bread and white people. The city of Ottawa 
there, uh, there wasn't a single black family in the city of Ottawa that I could see, and I lived there for, for 15 years before I went to university. Uh, there wasn't an East Indian family. There were Syrian uh, families who had been in Canada since about the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Syrian immigration, and then we called them Lebanese, because after 1919 they were Lebanese. Uh, Paul Anka was one of them. We went to high school together. Um, and I think, you know, where, where I really think Canada has its strength is that it has grown and been able to change. We had racist legislation. Uh, when I came to the country, there was still the Chinese Exclusion Act on the books of 1923 to exclude Chinese from immigrating to Canada. They didn't want yellow people to come and take jobs or do, I don't know, strange practices in closed curtain rooms or smoke things or whatever. Um, and there was enormous prejudice. I can give you all kinds of references to books that were written about it. They're very racist, totally racist, and the stereotypes are dreadful. So that I think that kind of racism, which existed on a kind of subliminal level, was overcome by people who said eventually, you know, I don't think that kind of makes much sense. And then after a world war, um, uh, when we received a lot of displaced people, we really started to see that our, our country had changed. And then by 1960, uh, and that's quite late on, but it's true, 1960, we were accepting people from colored nations. So I think we have grown as a country. We have seen that the people who come to Canada are resilience itself because this country has been built by immigrants. In Canada, the reason why I think immigration is so important is that everybody is only one or two generations removed from an immigrant relative. That's the country that we are, and we are proud of it. And we came to a country that luckily has a strong constitutional uh, uh, parliamentary democracy. We have a wonderful rule of law, and all of that is a structure into which people can fall happily. In terms of being a woman, I think it's very interesting to think that I uh, came into television in 1965, which is now about 56 years ago, believe it or not. Um, and it was very interesting because there were only two television networks. So we had a big audience, we had a very interesting time. And I was the first visible minority, as we now call it, on television. Though the CBC didn't hire me because of that. They hired me because they liked the way I did an interview. They liked the way I reviewed books. They liked things about me. And nobody ever said to me, you know, we hired you because you're a visible minority. Now do it or do your dance or whatever. And the thing that meant the most to me of being different on television was when I went north for the first time. We did... Um, a, series of programs on the um, uh, on women and on the the first uh, the first royal commission on the status of women and so I went to a Calwit and all these wonderful Inuit women came out to see me and they stared and stared at me and a number of them said you know you are the first person we ever saw who looked like us on television and I was deeply moved by that I thought how wonderful how wonderful that they think you know, I'm an Inuit, and maybe I am. I mean, you know, who knows how Inuit got to North America. They came across the Bering Strait. They came across from the Orient. We share the features. Certainly when I've been in a subway in Japan, for instance, uh, I've often thought a lot of Japanese looked like my Inuit friends. And so we don't know because we are all one, basically. We are all created uh, as a human race and with great differences. In the Quran, there's a wonderful, wonderful verse which is translated in different ways. And it's one that I hold to my heart because it is the essence, really, of what's behind belonging and inclusion. And this verse is, um, is just marvelous. It says that God could have created us all the same if he wanted to. But he didn't because he thought it would test us to deal with our differences. In Canada... We are answering that particular message in a very interesting way. And now when, you, when I used to go around to schools as governor general, 
And I'd look down at a class that had been assembled in a gym, and they were all sitting there. And I thought, what country am I in? All these children are so different. It was so different when I was a child, where everybody was white, and Canada was white. It's not like that anymore. And we have made that evolution without any hitch, really, because we have strong institutions, and we have a strong democracy because of the kind of governments that we've had. And I think really for me, it's so interesting to think that if you don't belong, then you're not part of things. And why I wanted to start the Institute for Canadian Citizenship when I left being Governor General was because of that little Portuguese Canadian girl's letter to me. It was because I want her to feel that she can become Governor General. I want her to feel that she does belong and that there's no barrier in her way. I think everybody in Canada should feel there are no barriers because we are an egalitarian society and we don't have those old class distinctions or the distinctions of the way you speak English. Everybody speaks English with kind of Canadian accent and that's the way we are. And that's what I want it to be. And I want people who came here to fulfill what Sir Wilfrid Laurier said in his marvelous speech when he welcomed Saskatchewan and Alberta into Confederation in 1905. I went out there in 2005 to celebrate with those two provinces. So I read Sir Wilfrid Laurier's speech when he welcomed them in. And he said, we will welcome the world here and the, the last will be as welcome as the first. And when these people come, they will be part of us and they will be like ourselves, Canadians. They will not forget what their parents were or where they came from, but they will participate fully in what Canada is. So we've had that in our background forever. We forget it all the time because I don't know, it gets drowned out by noise. It gets drowned out by other people's traditions. It gets drowned out in the American noise, particularly, and we do not have the same history, the same, the same political system, or the same uh, ethos as Americans. They're neighbors, they're friends, um, but they're not us, and we are not them. And in Canada, we have an immigration policy now that welcomes, that welcomes people that is very well stated as to how many immigrants will come, what they will be, what they will do. And the Institute of Canadian Citizenship has, for instance, a program in which we welcome Canadians. It's called Canoe, New Canadians, and they get for one year free access to about 15 or 1600 um, cultural institutions in Canada, plus all the provincial and national parks. And they get 50% off on Via Rail because right away we want them to feel when they've chosen Canada as their country that they belong, that they're part of us, and they should see the things that are in those grand old stone buildings, that they shouldn't feel because they work on an assembly line or they have shift work that, and they don't speak English very well, that they don't belong there. They do belong there. You know, even as soon as you start working in Canada, you're paying taxes in Canada, and those taxes, a part of them, go to subsidies for those cultural institutions are proprietors of them. And I want people to know that right from the start, we want them to be part of it and to know what that history is and what that inclusion actually means. I think it's fascinating that, you know, we talk about gender, genders and we talk about uh, things that, are, that separate us. And I can tell you that I grew up in a very rough time. When I was pregnant and with my first child, I went into my executive producer. I was, I was uh, doing, um, at the time I was doing Take 30, it was the last two years, I think. And I said, I'm going to have a baby. And he said, okay, well, if you're not back here from in six weeks after the baby's born, you're fired. We didn't have legislation for people to have maternity leave. And so I was back after six weeks. And I must say, that, you know, men make a lot of rules like that. So we then eventually got maternity leave. And maternity leave means you take your time off when your baby is born and you have a certain number of you. But you know, most people have think, uh, and most mothers and a lot of parents think that children, you know, are can be very well cared for um, uh, when they're tiny babies. But the interesting part of being a parent is when they start to walk and talk. So why can't we have the maternity and paternity leave when the child is older, 
you know, why, why are we stuck in these kind of rigid feelings that, you know, a woman gives birth and therefore she has to take the time off, etc. Why can't we make it a choice? You don't have to do it then. That's the thing about belonging in a society. You should have choices. Things should not be imposed on you. So the gender question of how genders are treated goes in with all the, the things that have to do with the way we treat other groups of people. And you, you go across different groups because you are black and a woman, or you are, um, uh, you are another gender and uh, you are another religion. All of these things work together. And I think we have to be very, very careful that we understand how important it is that they do not separate us, that they give us always the time and the interest to remember that we all belong together and that we can only make a country together that's worthwhile living in and worthwhile bringing children in and worthwhile welcoming foreigners and people from other parts of the world in if we stay true to ourselves. We've been very, very fortunate as a country because we have a triangular foundation, the indigenous peoples and then the French and the English. That's our tripod base. And on top of that, all the rest of the world has come and found its place. And we are a country that is, you know, functionally bilingual in both languages. It's very exciting. We were, we have the kind of, of understanding of each other religions uh, because we had a French Canadian Catholic prime minister in the middle of the 19th century when in the so-called mother country of Britain, Roman Catholics were not even allowed to vote, much less hold public office. Let's not forget things like that. Let's not forget, let's not think of ourselves as a new little funny country that's sort of not as big as the United States or that doesn't have as much cultural value as England and France. We are ourselves. We are Canadians and we have a very special gift to give of that. And that's because the belonging is part of the transformation. Nobody is the same when they come to Canada and become Canadians. Even if your parents said to you when you lived in Bombay, you know, you're going to be a doctor like your grandfather was. If you were a doctor in Bombay, you wouldn't be the same thing as if you were a doctor in Brampton, Ontario or in Vancouver, BC. You're different. You're different because you've become Canadian, because you've lived in a different climate, because you've been exposed to a people from all over the world who have become citizens like you. The diversity is the strength of this country, and that's why inclusion is so important. That's why we can't afford to stand off and say to people, you know, I don't think you really belong because you do this or you're like that. Um, with, with parity of genders, you get to the point where you understand that everybody must be treated equally and everybody has to be looked at for the wonder of their difference. That's something that we have to look at and understand how great it is that we have the ability to say, okay, we're not all alike, but let's make the most of that. We have to also still address old problems, violence against women, than what Me Too stands for, harassment. And I would just add as a footnote here that there is no woman who has gone into the workforce in Canada that I know of who has never experienced sexual harassment. I'll make that as a blanket statement because I believe it's true. I've witnessed it, I've experienced it, I see it still, and we still see it. It's in headlines all the time. And that's why we have to work to to, to, to against that. That's why we have to make sure that our values and our attitudes and the way in which we do things for both, for, for all genders is that there be mutual respect always. To be treated as many women have been for many years in the workforce and in certain professions is simply not acceptable anymore. And we have to also look at the phenomenon of violence against women. The violence against indigenous women is a shame to us the violence against any woman is a shame to us, and it is not among people who uh, don't know any better or people who don't have good incomes. When I was on the Fifth Estate, I did a large program on violence against women, and it's, it's across the boards of all income levels, 
And you know that too, because you've seen it yourselves, you've heard it, everybody knows that. And we have to work on those things to make them not acceptable and to make sure that there are they are barriers to entry to people who want to live decent lives. That if you want to live a decent life, you can't have those thoughts or do those actions. It's simply not possible. It's very interesting for us looking at our future that I think we don't have enough immigrants. And that's why the Institute of Canadian Citizenship, we are involved now with a program uh, which we want to start for pre-citizens. That is, as soon as people um, land, that we can start with, with giving them the access to these cultural institutions, to uh, the equality that that means, that they don't have to dress up. Also, the cultural institutions are very excited about it because it's, they get new audience that way. How else are they going to do it? And we have the, at, the, at the citizenship ceremonies now, you can go on your phone and you're told to go on your phone and get the Canoe app, it's C-A-N-O-O-O, -O -O, and you can join right away. And we had it as a kind of, you had to go to your, your, um, your computer and join, and that meant that half the people didn't bother. But now that you can do it right at your ceremony, we're getting a really nice, like 98% pickup. And we'll just have a wonderful time with that because we're expanding it from uh, organizations like museums and parks and so on into the performing arts. The Canadian Opera Company uh, started before this lockdown. They put up, you know, we don't, we didn't sell these 70 seats for tomorrow night. Who wants them? And in 30 seconds, the canoe people picked them up. Somebody said to me, you know, well, why would, would somebody who's coming here from um, Ethiopia want to go to the Canadian Opera Company? And I said, why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't you want to go and see something new? I mean, when, you're, when you are in a new country and you want to learn everything because you want to belong and you want to be part of that country and help to shape it and make sure that your children help to shape it, make sure that there aren't barriers to entry to anybody that you know you're related to or anybody, then of course you'll want to say, gee, I wonder what that's like. Just as we all try new foods, that's the beauty of Canada. We can. We all eat different kinds of foods, and that's because we have that population. That's because we know that everybody's food is interesting to them, and it's usually the thing that most people try to hang on to the most from the cultures they come from, because it's food is part of what you take into yourself. You make it part of yourself, and it's very reassuring to have the food you were originally nourished with or that your family was nourished with and know that you know, it's interesting and different. And Canada is a place where we can get all of that and we can share it with each other. And we don't think one thing is better than another. Oh, I know there are stories in which, you know, the kids say, you know, I, I went to school with with my, my family's kind of food and the kids made fun of me and said, why don't you eat peanut butter and jelly? Well, you know, life is tough, okay? And really, I think you've got to relax and think, all right, they didn't like my sandwich, but you know, maybe I don't like peanut butter, or maybe I will learn to like peanut butter. There's nothing is given. Uh, people have to work. People have to take rough bumps. Not everybody's going to love you or welcome you with open arms. Society isn't made up that way. Margaret Thatcher, not my favorite person, said uh, there is no such thing as society. She's absolutely wrong. There is society, and society is made up of people that you like and people that you don't like and people that you actively dislike, people that you don't want to stand in the same bus shelter with, uh, people that you don't want to have lunch with, but they are a human being and they are a Canadian usually and you have they have as much right to exist and take partake of everything that we have as a country as you do. So give it up, okay? It doesn't matter. You don't have, that's why I don't like things like love is all you need. You don't have to love everybody but give them their space, let them be human beings the way you are. The only place where you can be, you know, take your distance is if they commit a crime uh, or if they do something that is noticeably bad, even if it doesn't cross a legal, a legal line. But otherwise, you have to let people live. And when you become a citizen, as I say, I've said to many, many people, it's really, you don't have a Sunday buffet on all you can eat, anything you can pick out. 
you can say you don't you can't just say I want the roast beef and I, I don't want the lobster and I think I'll have the butter tart but I won't have the black forest cake when you become a citizen it is a fixed menu everybody eats from the fixed menu because we're Canadians and we don't pick and choose we have the fixed menu that's your part of the bargain of being what we are and I think when we want to include people when we want people to belong we know that we can say we want you to be a part of all of this we want you to give as much as you can to your country and to bounce back from any that you know any setbacks that you had before you came it takes an enormous amount of courage to change your country even if you're not sort of thrown out of it because you were conquered as I was in a war and you had to leave as a refugee with what you what you could find and have that's the extreme part but even to the part where you think maybe my life will be better for my kids and me if I go to a place called Canada and I think all of that gamut from the having to leave something and having to give it up and the regrets and the torments that that might leave you with which you'll have to get through to the we think it would be a better place to live and we think you know the education will be better etc all of that is included in our national vision of ourselves just remember that we all see ourselves as Canadians that's the way we have to live we have to say we are Canadians and we're going to be this kind of, of country and this is what we are and this is what we live for for our children this is what we want for the future we may not live to see it that's what it means for instance to endow a business school and give your name to it because you say I want this to live forever um, and I'm going to attach it to a university so that I know that it will be taken care of so that I know these goals that I think are worthwhile will be important to do that's what it means that's what it means to all of us because we all are part of each other we all are people working towards doing the same thing to make a country that will be worthy of handing on to others and I have seen in my lifetime how we have improved as Canadians I have been really happy that I was able to do that and that my mentor who was my high school English teacher who told me that I could make a difference if I you know became a good public speaker if I went to the University of Toronto where he had gone if I did certain kinds of things he was the person outside of my family who was the greatest mentor to me and he was of course an educator by belief by heart by everything and I think of him and and often I can honestly say that when I'm giving a talk not like now in zoom because I'm looking at myself for heaven's sake but in a room and I see you know it's two or three hundred people I can see Mr. Mann at the back of that hall looking at me and nodding or going mm. he's with me all the time and I got that in a Canadian collegiate the best collegiate in Eastern Canada I have to say I got that uh, because somebody saw something in me and wanted to nurture it and we all know that we want to be nurtured and then nurture in turn and that's what belonging actually means and that's what doing things in something like helping new citizens to get their feet so that they can contribute which they want to do and to help them cut through any barriers of entry is the most important thing that one can do I'll never lose my refugee mentality and when I was little my mother used to say you know something might happen to Canada and then we'd have to leave again and we have she said I, and I don't want to be as incompetent as I as I was when I came to Canada I couldn't do housework and I, I didn't know how to cook or anything and so we have to prepare ourselves uh, that we might lose everything again and be thrown somewhere else it was really quite funny and she said you know your brother is very personable and um, and he's nice he can be a butler and um, and she said you have a rather bad temper sometimes when you're cross so I think you should learn to cook so you can work in a kitchen and do nice food and so on but you don't have to meet people all the time so we were always prepared somehow that things might not work out 
but you know, they did work out and they worked out for all of us. And I'm, you know, I'm very glad to be here and that the boat didn't take me any other place but Canada. But I think that knowing that has made me feel better about how I can help others to seriously help others to belong. And I think in my lifetime, that's what I've lived for. That's what I've given my energies for because I truly believe, I truly believe what John Donne, the great poet and um, minister of the 17th century said, and I studied a lot of his poetry when I was in university. John Donne said, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory or a manner of thy friends or thyself were. Each man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Clarkson, for that inspiring talk. Your life, journey, experiences are so pertinent for our theme of resilience. While many of us cannot imagine some of the challenges you experienced through your life, so much of what you discussed is relevant to the human condition, and I think we can all reflect on how that is relevant to our own life experiences. So in effect, you have helped us belong. Thank you for sharing your story with us, and I will now turn to Lisa to introduce the question period. Thanks, Gerarda. Um, we'd now like to open the floor for questions from our audience. Uh, this will be your opportunity to ask Madame Clarkson questions related to tonight's talk about her life experiences. So you can go ahead and submit your questions via the hop in chat function. So I'd like to start off with one of my own questions, if you don't mind, Madame Clarkson. Um, at the time, you were only the second female identified Governor General in Canada. And for many women, they may feel as though they have to prove something to their colleagues, especially in you know highly gender imbalanced fields. So for example, feeling pressure to do more or work harder um, to show that they're just as capable. So did you feel this pressure as Governor General? And if you did, how did you manage that? Well, I think I didn't feel it because I've always pressured myself and um, because I've always felt that whatever I decided to do, I had better do it really well. And today in an earlier question and answer period with, with some people uh, at Guelph, I said to them that you must never do anything where you don't feel that you're the one that could do it uh, better than anybody else. I've been asked to do a lot of things in my life and many things I've turned down that other people would love to do and think would be great and still, you know, that's, that's a fact. I asked myself, can somebody do it as well as I can? Let them. But if I feel that I can do it with a difference, then I will accept to do it. And that's always been something I suppose that I, I felt. Um, I would never plunge into something thinking, oh gosh, you know, they've asked me to do this, I should do it. Oh, they've given me a lot of money for this, I should do it. It's, that is not the right thing. You have to be true to yourself. You have to be understanding of what you can do and what your own talents are and, and how far you can go with that. You never, especially as a woman, all right, I'll put this in, never do anything what somebody tells you to do will be good for you. You listen to yourself. Build your self-confidence. If you don't have it now, you know, do something that will help you build your self-confidence. I do always think that one of my greatest, um, I said, gifts in life was to have a father who was my passport into the male world. Because the world is created by men for them. So if you're a woman 
you have to learn what their code is and what they do and how they speak. And I was very fortunate that my father, who had the most wonderful sense of humor as well, uh, was able to kind of take me there and let me feel uh, not comfortable with it. You never feel comfortable if you're a woman in a totally male world. But to understand it, uh, to work either with it or around it, and to not feel in any way that you were lesser because you were not part of that male perspective, that you would have your own female perspective. And that's that was what was important. And that's what you have to develop. I'm afraid that, you know, as things go on, having a strong mother is a wonderful thing. And, you know, I would never uh, denigrate that. But you need to have a strong role model as a person. And if it's the man in your, in your family who's given you that passport into a man's world, it's easier for you to deal with all the hindrances that come with going into the man's world. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a very inspiring. Um, we do have an audience question. Uh, how would you define vulnerability? How do you think being vulnerable is important to leadership? I think it's very important. I think you, you never really lose vulnerability. And I think that's one of the things that women can bring, um, can bring to leadership roles is that they don't pretend to be impervious to everything. And they don't pretend that they can be so strong, etc. Uh, that's what that, those are male values, and women's values, I think, are that they tend to be able to see the long term in things. They tend to uh, be able to um, think of a future beyond themselves. Um, they tend to be able to listen. Uh, because I think little girls are brought up to listen um, and they want to listen and they develop a little bit faster than boys as, as children. You see this when you have children. Um, so all of those things I think are really helpful and to keep yourself vulnerable is very, very important. That you must always be able to be touched uh, by some dreadful situation. You cannot, you know, you can, when I see what's happening to the Rohingya, um, in Myanmar, and now what's happening to the Burmese in Myanmar, it feels hideous for both of them, it's awful. But you you have to have, you know, Dostoevsky says in, in Crime and Punishment, man, man, you cannot live without pity. And I think that's what we have to develop always in people. They have to keep their compassion. They have to keep their love. There's a wonderful woman called Mary Gordon who has a program called roots of empathy and she goes into uh, schools in, in um, challenged neighborhoods and she's been doing this for about 25 years um, and she teaches goes with a couple and their newborn baby and she goes into classes of kids under grade six and she the, the couple come with their baby every week so that the children learn to look at the couple with the baby and um, they, they watch the baby's development and so on. And it's a way of teaching empathy. It's a way of teaching how you relate to things. And there was one little boy who was making a terrible fuss, Mary told me, and he was difficult in the schoolyard and everything. And he would sit there glumly when the child, when people came with, with little Isabel. And then he hit out at, at somebody right in the middle of it. And he went to the window and so everybody was very stunned. And then he started to cry. And Mary said to him, what's wrong? And he said, how do you think you could ever learn to love people, anybody, if you've never been loved? And I think, you know, you have to think, you look at people and you think of what they've been doing or some of the most loathsome things. I think what was done to them? What, what, what on earth happened to them to make them that way? And you have to go to the roots of it. And so you keep yourself vulnerable so that, yes, your feelings get hurt by things and people are, you know, don't like you and they, you know, they, they, they say rotten things about you. You have to develop a carapace that lets you live on. But it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt you. It doesn't mean that you aren't touched deeply by it or wish and are glad that your mother wasn't around to see it, that sort of thing. 
but you have to keep yourself always vulnerable because it's a core of being human. It's a core of our relationship to each other. Thank you for that uh, thoughtful response. Um, I have another audience question um, that, I, that I, um, I, I love. It's uh, an audience member asking a question for her daughter. Um, what advice would you give to a young girl aspiring to be a leader in today's society? Go for it. You know, do whatever you, everything that you can do, do it. And don't let anybody say, oh, you're doing too much or you shouldn't be doing that. Um, you have to really just say, uh, do as much as you, as you feel you can, but always with that caveat of knowing that um, you shouldn't take on things that you're not good at. I, I, earlier today, I said to somebody that uh, when I was first in television, I, was, I would get a lot of letters when I have this really wonderful relationship with my audience at Take 30. It was a, a wonderful audience that used to write to me a lot and, and just had a wonderful thing. And, and one of the things uh, a woman wrote to me, a young woman wrote to me and said, I watch you and I want to be like you and I want to do a program and I want to, and I do it in my high school. We record things. They were doing stuff in high school by then. I think it was in the mid seventies. And, uh, and I, they say, I'm good at it. She said, the only problem is every time before I go on camera, I have to throw up. So I wrote back to her and said, don't do it. <laughs> you mustn't do anything that is against your nature. Your body is telling you something. You may think you want this, but if you can't, if you can't do it, you should feel excited, warm, happy um, that you're going to go on, that you're going to interview somebody, that you're going to, you know, tell somebody a story or whatever. But if you feel that you're doing that and it's somehow against what your body is saying, don't do it. I mean, what are you doing it for? For fame? For you know, to get a new boyfriend. I mean, what is that? What it, What does that mean? So I have this little motto, which I don't want anybody to misunderstand, but it is, if it's easy, do it. So you never knock down a door to get into the room. You put your hand, that hand on that knob and that door just comes open for you. And you have to develop things of yourself that give you the confidence that you know what's going to be okay for you and what isn't. And women have, cannot be told what to do. Don't let anyone ever tell you what to do or what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this, that kind of line. Um, you have to really always think, what, what have I developed? What am I really thinking about? Where will I go with this? And that's, and that's the other side of vulnerability that feeds, feeds into the other question actually. Thank you so much. Um, just keeping um, you know, my eye on the time, I think uh, we'll move into the uh, student awards now. So thank you everyone uh, for your questions. Madame Clarkson, it has been truly an honor to have you join us tonight. I know that we've all taken away some valuable lessons from your life experiences. It's now our pleasure to introduce, to announce the He For She Student and Community Awards recipients. Each year, our He For She campaign awards two scholarships of $5,000 each to a female Lang business student and a female engineering student from the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences. These two scholarships recognize students who have shown resilience through adversity and purposeful leadership. Each year, we rename the scholarship after our He For She keynote speaker, and I'm pleased to award this year's Adrian Clarkson Resilience Award recipient from Lang to hospitality and tourism student, Bree Johnson. Congratulations, Bree. Bree will receive a $5,000 scholarship in recognition of her leadership. Bree will now provide a few words. Thank you, Lisa Lang School of Business and Kim and Stu Lang with the Angel Gabriel Foundation for the opportunity of receiving the Resilience Scholarship. I learned resilience from my parents and grandparents who showed me that if things don't go as planned, that's okay. As long as you try your best and stay happy, everything will work out eventually. In the past few years alone, I've worried about my family's health and my health and a lot more. 
and I understand what it feels like to feel helpless and want to give up. The reason I'm speaking today is to remind you that there's always hope if you choose to find it. There's so much good that we all have to share with the world and happiness that we can share with one another. Thank you again for this scholarship and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you, Bree, and I echo Lisa's congratulations on your well-deserved award. It is now my pleasure to announce the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences Engineering recipient, the winner of the Adrian Clarkson Resilience Award for an engineering student who has demonstrated resilience and leadership is Chelsea Ohile Ehemiage. Chelsea is a fifth year engineering student in the School of Engineering. She is co-president of Engineering for the Guelph Black Professionals at the University of Guelph and is a mentor for the Women in Science and Engineering group at the University of Guelph. Congratulations. Chelsea will now provide a few words. Hello everyone. My name is Chelsea Ohiele Ehimiyagi and I am delighted to have been selected as this year's recipient for the He For She Resilience Scholarship. Prior to my enrollment in university, I have always heard about gender inequality and how so many people have been affected by it. I never really understood the issue and I never anticipated experiencing it directly. Being a woman in mechanical engineering exposed me to different roller coaster experiences that I did not think I would successfully overcome. I was often the only woman in my team and always ended up being assigned the role of report writing or project organizing. I was really given the opportunity to get my hands dirty while building project parts or prototypes. I enrolled in mechanical engineering to obtain both practical and theoretical experience, but for some reason I found that I was being deprived of practical experience. I questioned my abilities as an engineer. Four years later, I have learned to own up to my skills and competences, and I am ever ready to display it. I have been opportunate enough to be surrounded by peers who inspired me to continue in engineering. They encouraged me to take on leadership roles and reminded me how I can be a source of motivation to other women. Gender equality initiatives are important to help create awareness and help people understand the benefits of having a community that allows for gender equity. It is a fundamental human right and every woman should be given an opportunity to express their opinions, their feelings, and impact the world in their own way. I want to use this medium to motivate any woman that is currently doubting her abilities. As Benjamin Franklin said, you can do whatever you set your mind to do. You just have to trust in yourself and believe. I have committed to joining the global movement for gender equality because we all have a role to play in becoming the change agents we hope to see. I want to specifically thank the Angel Gabriel Foundation and Kim and Stu Lang for being the generous donors of this award. Thank you, Gerard Darrington, the interim dean of the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences for presenting me with this award. I'm so impressed with our students and their leadership. Well done, Chelsea. Now we move on to our He For She Ally Award that celebrates the actions of an undergraduate student at U of G for their commitment and actions towards the He For She campaign, recognizing they are a true ally for gender equality. To announce the winner of the Ally Award, please welcome the University of Guelph's Associate Vice President of Diversity and Human Rights, Indira Nadu Harris. Hello everyone, I'm Indira Nadu Harris, the Associate Vice President of Diversity and Human Rights at the University of Guelph. You know, the He for She program is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the strength and leadership of our community and shine a bright light on those at the U of G who are working tirelessly to promote equity, inclusion, and acceptance in our campus family. I am so pleased to have the opportunity tonight to present the He for She Ally Award. The He for She Ally Award recognizes a remarkable U of G undergraduate student who has demonstrated through their actions that they are an ally, 
a friend, and committed to gender equality. This $2,500 scholarship recognizes the importance of gender equity by acknowledging and promoting gender equality for all. And our winner today has done just that. You know, building communities and creating environments where everyone is accepted, included, and celebrated is not only the right thing to do, it creates a strong foundation for success for all of us. And encouraging women to get involved, to raise their voices at the table, and boldly share their ideas and perspectives has been proven to contribute positively to the economy, industry, and social programs. So, I am so pleased to honor an exceptional individual today who is working hard to be an ally for women in our community. She is bold, she is strong, and she is fearless. Everyone, this year's winner of the He for She Ally Award is fourth year adult development student, Amy Cavanaugh. Amy's pronouns are she or her, and she is a champion of the LGBTQ2SIA plus community at the U of G, helping to create safe spaces for folks on campus, so important. She is an advocate for the normalization of sharing pronouns to help promote inclusivity. She's also a peer helper at the Wellness Education and Promotion Center. Amy will receive a $2,500 scholarship in recognition of her inspiring actions. Congratulations, Amy. You are an incredible role model for folks in our community, and you have absolutely earned this important recognition. Thank you, folks, and thank you to the Jordan S. Lyons School of Business and Economics for sponsoring this award. This award and gender equality means a lot to me. I've seen the mental strain and deterioration that transgender and non-binary folks face as they navigate an invalidating binary system. This pain lit a fire in me to use my privilege as a cisgendered person to be a voice for those being hurt by this unjust system and to do my part in making the University of Wealth Campus a safer place for people of all genders. Thank you, Amy and Indira. The efforts to achieve gender equality cannot rest on only the shoulders of us as individuals. Sustainable, ethical businesses, organizations, and societal leaders have a responsibility and an opportunity to be champions for gender equality. We established the He For She Impact Award to recognize a local business or organization in the Guelph Wellington region that is actively promoting and improving gender equality within their organization and the community. In addition to receiving the Impact Award, the recipient will also have a $2,500 donation made in their name to the Guelph YMCA, YWCA, Safe Sisters, a weekly drop-in program for girls in grades seven and eight, designed to provide a safe space for them to learn about and discuss personal safety and positive well-being in terms of their community, their body, and social media. To announce the winner of the He For She Impact Award, Please welcome Vice President External at the University of Guelph, Daniel Atlin. My name is Daniel Atlin, and I'm proud to serve as the Vice President External at the University of Guelph. The He For She Impact Award recognizes a local business in the Guelph Wellington region that's actively promoting and improving gender equity through initiatives they champion. The University of Guelph is proud to present the He For She Impact Award to Skyline Group of Companies. Founded in Guelph, Skyline is a fully integrated asset acquisition, management, development, and investment business. With nearly 1,000 staff across Canada, Skyline has made a commitment to empower its people through important initiatives and policies and to promote and celebrate the many accomplishments of its team. Because of their leadership, we are proud to support a charitable donation of $2,500 made out in Skyline's name to the YMCA's Safe Sisters program. Thank you, Skyline.
Thanks, Daniel, for that great introduction. We're honored to receive the He for She Impact Award for 2021. A big thank you to the He for She campaign at the University of Guelph. Our roots as a company are in Guelph, and we're proud that the University of Guelph is supporting this powerful movement for gender equality. We also want to thank the Angel Gabriel Foundation for their generous donation to the Safe Sisters program. Thank you for making this donation on behalf of Skyline. We do business in many industries, real estate, clean energy, and investment, to name a few. And female leadership is often underrepresented in these industries. We're proud to be a part of challenging and changing this underrepresentation. If we can be champions of gender equality and influence change, it'll have a ripple effect in each of the industries we operate in. There are so many extraordinary women at Skyline. They are leaders, experts, and heroes. We participate in panels, discussions, and speeches, sharing our industry expertise. We are featured in publications and represent Skyline in the press. Our female Skyliners' accomplishments have helped to grow Skyline to a national level. We celebrate and promote their accomplishments wherever we can. Whether we're nominating our female staff for awards or holding internal events to celebrate their business triumphs, we believe it is a step towards equal resources, opportunities, and participation. It's our honor to receive the He for She Impact Award for 2021. Thank you to our incredible female Skyliners and their allies. Hi everyone, my name is Melissa Haynes and I'm the Supervisor of Youth Programs and Community Outreach here at the YMCA of Three Rivers at our Guelph Y location. Congratulations to the Skyline group of companies on being honored as this year's He for She Impact Award recipient for your work on gender equity within your organization. We're so pleased to hear about this important work that you're doing in this space in our community. On behalf of the YMCA of Three Rivers, we want to extend our sincere thanks to the Angel Gabriel Foundation and specifically to Stu and Kim Lang for your generous donation to our Safe Sisters program on behalf of Skyline. On a more personal level, I want to thank you so much as this program is one that's very near and dear to my heart and that I'm incredibly passionate about. Each week, I have the privilege of working with many young ladies in the Safe Sisters program. I get to witness their personal gro growth and development throughout the program and see an impact of the program on a weekly basis. So thank you so much. Safe Sisters is a community-based program for girls in grades seven and eight and in high school. The program is currently being run in the Sheldell neighborhood as well as at the Guelph YMCA. Girls attend the program on a weekly basis and during the program, we discuss a variety of topics and issues that are, the girls are facing in their lives. We work through topics such as positive well-being, healthy relationships, substance abuse, mental health, sexuality, and life skills. Each week, the content changes and we meet the girls exactly where they're at in their lives at that time. Our goal is not only to provide support at that time, but to also connect the girls with resources in their community. So when we're not around, they're able to have support. We could share many examples with you of girls' lives who have been positively impacted because of the Safe Sisters program. Girls who have built mental health skills, self-confidence, self-esteem, left unhealthy relationships, developed conflict resolution skills, and most importantly, developed lifelong friendships within their community. It's important work and we're so excited to be able to continue this on because of you and your generous donation. This donation will impact many young girls in our community and will help them thrive. On behalf of the YMCA of Three Rivers, we're so appreciative to all of you and your support of our Safe Sisters program. On a personal level, I'm forever grateful for this donation and so are the girls. Thank you. Thank you to Skyline and your leadership team for prioritizing gender equality and being a true role model for businesses to aspire to. We're coming to the end of our program tonight, and I do want to thank you for joining us and for engaging in this important and meaningful conversation. If you would like more information on our He for She campaign, please visit our website at uoguelph.ca slash lang. To conclude our program, I would like to bring back Anthony Hall from Gryphon Football with a special presentation for Madame Clarkson. Thanks, Lisa, and thank you, Madam Clarkson. It was truly an honor to hear you speak. I'd just like to thank you, Ms. Clarkson, for those inspiring the word of wisdom Thank you for engaging in this important conversation around gender equality and the importance of resiliency.
As a small token of our appreciation, I would like to ask you to open a box that has been mailed to you. Inside, you'll find your own Griffin football jersey. You are officially part of the Griffin football family. I hope to see you in the near future once COVID is already done. And we'd like to invite you to one of our games to be cheering loud with the pop group. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. And I'm very proud of this, of this sweater. And I will wear it uh, when I come to one of your games in the future. And um, I think we will see an end, uh, you know, the, the end of the beginning. We're seeing the end of the beginning of this COVID crisis. So let's see, let's hope for the uh, end of the end at some point. And I will join you down in Guelph very happily. I've had a wonderful day with you all. Enjoyed it so much. Um, all the questions, all the, all the um, uh, interesting ideas that you sparked in me um, really enriched me and helped me to understand what a great place Guelph is and to be very delighted that I was able to take part in the He for She um, event and to, be, to meet all of you who worked very hard to put this together under very difficult circumstances. I hope the next time we see each other will be in person. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for that farewell. Thank you, Madam Clarkson, and thank you to all of our speakers tonight, and to all of you uh, for participating from many, many different countries from around the world. Good night. <laughs>